Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing calcium signaling. Okay, so we've now discussed the transporters which are present on the plasma membrane, which are involved in extruding calcium from the cytoplasm and maintaining that low cytoplasmic calcium concentration of 100 nanomolar, uh, which we know we have within the cytoplasm of cells uh, when those cells are at rest. Okay, what I now want to talk about is how we maintain a higher concentration of calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, we know that we have a lot of calcium stored in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, mainly bound to uh, proteins that are capable of binding calcium, particularly calcium. So I now want to talk about the pump that is present on the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, which is involved in pumping calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum uh, lumen. Okay, right, so this pump is going to be a primary active transporter. Okay, so this is now representing the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Okay, the upper portion here is representing the cytoplasm. Okay, and below the membrane, this is going to be the lumen. Okay, uh, so bear in mind that now the cytoplasm is on the opposite side uh, to where it was previously, okay, previously this was the pla this was the extracellular fluid and this was the uh, cytoplasm when this was the plasma membrane, okay, but now we're letting this be the ER membrane and this is going to be the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, okay, and outside we're going to have the cytoplasm. Okay, right, so there is a, a really important primary active transporter present within the ER membrane which is involved in transporting calcium into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and I will colour in this really important transporter in turquoise here. Okay, and this transporter is known as the CIRCA, okay, which stands for sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. Okay, so the first thing that I need to say is that there is a structure analogous to the endoplasmic reticulum uh, that is present in muscle cells, so skeletal muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells, smooth muscle cells, which is also going to be a calcium store within cells, okay, which we will come across later when we come on to discuss uh, smooth skeletal and cardiac muscle contraction. Okay, uh, so that's what the sarcoplasmic reticulum is. It's this analogous thing to the endoplasmic reticulum in these um, uh, muscle cells, basically. So sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum. And again, this pump is present not just in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, but also present in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, hence why it's called the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum. And then the CA, once again, is for calcium ATPase. Okay, right. So that is the circa then. Okay, so the circa once again, like the plasma membrane calcium ATPase, is going to be a primary active transporter. It's going to hydrolyze ATP and it's going to use the energy that it gets from the hydrolysis of ATP to drive the movement of calcium into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, against its concentration gradient out of the cytoplasm basically. Okay, so basically circa moves two calcium ions into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum for every ATP molecule it hydrolyzes. Okay, so here is the hydrolysis of ATP now down to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, and when it moves those two calciums in, it, like the plasma membrane calcium ATPase, also brings other stuff back from the endoplasmic reticulum lumen into uh, the cytoplasm of the cell, and again it's protons, so it moves free protons back out of the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. Okay, so circa again is one of these p-type ATPases, so just to reinforce the concept, I'm now going to talk you through in more detail the mechanism by which the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase functions. 
Okay, right. So it's one of these p-type ATPases. So again, this movement between the cytosolic facing conformation and the luminal facing conformation is going to be made uh, when um, you add a phosphate group onto the circa protein. So let's show this here. Okay, so once again, uh, circa is going to have these two states. It's going to have a state that is facing the cytoplasm, and it's this state in which we're going to start off. Okay, and in this cytoplasmic state, of course, what's going to happen is the two calcium ions, and I'll just squeeze the two in there, uh, the two calcium ions are going to come and bind in. So I'll highlight the two calciums in orange here, and we'll once again color in our circa pump facing into the cytoplasm at present in interquoise here. Okay, right. So what's going to happen is the two calciums are going to bind to the binding site on the circa protein when it is facing into the cytoplasm like so. Okay, and at present it's got that high affinity binding site for calcium. Now, what then will happen is an ATP molecule will phosphorylate the circa protein, okay, and therefore will uh, become an ADP molecule, so it will give up its gamma phosphate uh, to the circa protein, becoming an ADP molecule in the process, okay, and that gamma phosphate that you've now added on to the circa protein here, okay, that's what is going to trigger this conformational change in the circa protein, where it's going to move from being in this uh, cytosolic facing uh, conformation to being in a luminal facing conformation. So let me now show this. So here it has now changed conformation to this inwardly facing conformation like so. It still has that phosphate group attached to it. And now we know what will happen. Once it's in the inwardly facing conformation, that binding site will lose its affinity for calcium basically. And it will release the calcium ions into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so here are two calciums being released into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, right, and I'll just colour in that phosphate group also there and in purple. Okay, then of course we know what's going to happen. Uh, this new conformation where we have the binding site facing into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, that is now going to have affinity for protons in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So now what's going to happen is free protons from the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum are going to bind to that binding site that faces into the lumen here, so here are the free protons, they're going to bind into the luminally facing binding site on the circa, okay, then what will happen is this phosphate group will end up being removed, so note it's not the free protons binding that causes the movement back to here, it's the removement of that phosphate group, okay, so we will remove that phosphate group, and then you'll return back to the inwardly facing state, Okay, like so, and then all that needs to happen now is those protons need to come off, which of course they will do because now that we're back into the cytosolically facing state, and I shouldn't really say inwardly facing state, outwardly facing state, I should be saying cytosolically facing state and luminally facing state. So now we're back into the uh, cytosolically facing state here. Um, the binding site loses its affinity for those protons. Okay, so the protons will be released into the cytoplasm now, and now that cytosolically facing binding site there has now got its affinity back again for calcium, so now we can go back to this uh, stage of the process where two calcium ions can come and bind into that cytosolically facing binding site. Okay, so again, uh, the movement from the cytosolically facing state to the luminally facing state is driven by the addition of this phosphate group, and then the movement back again is driven by the removal of that phosphate group. Okay, so uh, that's why it's called a P-type ATPase, because the phosphate group is so foundational to the change in conformation that is foundational to transportation. Okay, right, so that's the circa pump which is on the uh, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and which can move calcium from the cytoplasm of the cell 
back into the endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the equivalent calcium store in muscle tissue. Okay, right. Another important thing to say is that circa is inhibited by high calcium concentration in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so basically when calcium gets up to the right level in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum lumen, it will make sure that the circa pumps are turned off, basically. It causes the circa pumps to be turned off, so they stop working once the endoplasmic reticulum calcium level is at the correct value. Okay, right. So now, before we actually begin talking about IP3 receptor signaling and ryanodine receptor signaling and all of that, I want to talk about uh, how you can refill the endoplasmic reticulum calcium store if it's necessary. Okay, so what happens if the calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum goes down and you need to fill it back up. Where do you get the calcium from? Because calcium is very low within the cytoplasm. What we really need to do is somehow get it from the extracellular fluid, and indeed that's what we're going to do, okay? So what I firstly want to study is a pathway that is called store-operated calcium entry. Okay, and for short, store-operated calcium entry is abbreviated down to SOCE, like so. So the S is for store, okay, the O is then for operated, okay, and then the CE is for calcium entry. Okay, and this is a way, basically, of refilling the endoplasmic reticulum stores uh, when they become depleted, so store-operated calcium entry. So let me draw, once again, my little picture of our cell here. So here is our uh, cell membrane, like so. Here's the inner nuclear membrane, and then I'll draw the outer nuclear membrane, which will be continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum here. Okay, so, special contact points between uh, the endoplasmic reticulum and the plasma membrane. So, for instance, let's say down here or up here. Okay, I'll use the one up here because it's easier to draw up here. Okay, so let's say this special little contact point between the endoplasmic reticulum membrane here and the plasma membrane, where they're very nice and close, this could be a site where we're going to have stored operated calcium entry. And the basic principle of what's going to happen here is that when calcium is too low in the endoplasmic reticulum, so we've not got enough calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum, and we need to have calcium stored in the endoplasmic reticulum, it's absolutely crucial for cell signaling that we have a good amount of calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum. If we lose it in the endoplasmic reticulum, then a whole bunch of signaling pathways are going to become useless. They're not going to be able to work. Okay, so we're going to look at this pathway, store-operated calcium entry, which is a pathway for refilling depleted endoplasmic reticuli. Okay, uh, so endoplasmic reticulums, which are uh, too empty, basically, haven't got enough calcium stored in them. Okay, and the principle is that we are going to get the calcium from the extracellular fluid. So we have a lot of calcium stored in the extracellular fluid. Okay, now if we're going to get it from the extracellular fluid into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to have to go into the cytoplasm and then into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so, um, basically, let me draw this junction out in more detail. Here's the endoplasmic reticulum membrane here. Here's the plasma membrane. Basically, you have special channels uh, for calcium in the extracellular fluid which can be opened in response to calcium level in the endoplasmic reticulum lumen being too low. Okay, so there is this special channel which we are going to study in just a moment. Okay, and we will be looking at exactly how this gets opened in response to there being too low calcium in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, but there is this special channel in the plasma membrane which can open and conduct calcium ions from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm in response to calcium in the ER being too low. Okay, and this channel has a special name. It's called the crack channel. Okay, and what this stands for is calcium, that's the first C, and then release, that's the R, and then it's A for activated, and then uh, C for channel. 
Okay, calcium release activated. Oh, actually, no, no, no. The second C is for calcium. Again, okay, it's called the crack channel, so it stands for the calcium release activated calcium, and then of course you'd need the word channel, okay? So you'll call this the crack channel for calcium release activated uh, calcium channel. Okay, right, so calcium release activated calcium channel, that's the crack. Right, okay, so, um, why is it called that? Well, when is it going to be opened? It's going to be opened when the endoplasmic reticulum calcium level gets too uh, low, basically. Okay, and why will the endoplasmic reticulum calcium get too low? Well, it will get too low if you have released calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So that's why it's called the crack channel, because uh, it is activated when uh, you have released calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum and therefore endoplasmic reticulum calcium is too low. So that's what's called the calcium release activated calcium channel. Okay, you might also call it this the store operated channel. So some people will call it the SOC for store operated uh, calcium channel, the SOC channel. Okay, right. Um, so, both of those names you might see used for this channel. Okay, and basically, this is a calcium channel in the plasma membrane which can be opened when the endoplasmic reticulum calcium is too low, and we will see exactly how in just a moment. Okay, now, that will bring the calcium from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm. How will it then get into the endoplasmic reticulum? Well, we know the answer to that. You'll have circa pumps on the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, which can now use this high calcium in the uh, cytoplasm as an opportunity to pump calcium ions into uh, the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so what we now want to look at then is uh, the crack channel, the calcium release activated calcium channel. We want to look at the structure of that first thing. Okay, then we want to look at how this channel is going to be activated to open in response to uh, endoplasmic reticulum calcium stores being too low, basically. Okay, we want to look at the pathway which leads to its opening. So let's start off by discussing uh, the structure of the crack channel. So the crack channel is a little bit controversial, okay? For a very, very long time, it was thought that the crack channel was a tetramer. Okay, but now it's starting to swing away from the idea that it's a tetrama and towards the idea that it is instead a hexama. Okay, so what I'm going to start off by showing you is the protein subunits out of which you build a crack channel. So crack channels are not just an individual protein, that's probably the first thing that I should have said. It's not an individual protein, it's made up of multiple subunits stuck together. And the big controversy at the moment is as to whether it's made up of four protein subunits stuck together, or whether it's made up of six protein subunits stuck together, okay? Uh, so it was thought for a very long time that it was made out of four subunits stuck together, but now it's starting to emerge that it's probably made out of six subunits stuck together. Okay, so I'm going to start off by showing you what everyone can agree on, which is what this protein subunit that builds the crack channel actually is. So the subunits that build the crack channel uh, are proteins called Aura I1 proteins. Okay, uh, and let me just show you the structure of an Aura I1 protein. Specifically, let's have a look at the membrane spanning topology of an Aura I1 protein. So here, I'm now going to show the endoplasmic reticulum membrane now as a uh, phospholipid bilayer. So this side is the side facing the lumen. Okay, so this is the uh, lumen. Oh, wait. Sorry, we're talking about the crack channel, which is in the plasma membrane. Okay, so get rid of this. This is the plasma membrane. This is the cell membrane, okay? This is the cytoplasm here, okay? And this is the extracellular fluid here. I apologize for that. Okay, so Aura I1 is the subunit of the crack channel. It's going to be present in the plasma membrane. So this phospholipid bilayer here is representing the plasma membrane. Okay, right. Uh, so, Aura I1 proteins have four membrane-spanning alpha helices in total, and they have both their N and C termini uh, intracellularly. So, here is the N terminus of the Aura I1 protein. Then, uh, we'll have 
the first membrane spanning alpha helix here, second membrane spanning alpha helix here, third here, fourth here, then you have an important domain uh, on the C-terminal tail portion here, which I'll um, give you the name of in a moment. So this domain here, this is going to be really important for the activation of the crack channels, which consist of these aura I1 proteins, and this is called the CC domain, standing for coiled coil domain. Okay, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter uh, that it is actually a coiled coil, uh, so we'll just call it the CC domain. Okay, right. Uh, so, what I now want to show you then is how you can use these Aura I1 proteins to build either a tetramer or a hexamer. So I'm going to show uh, you both the tetramer and the hexamer. Okay, and as I say, it's still controversial as to whether this is a tetramer or a hexamer. So to do this, what I'm firstly going to do is uh, color code up uh, the membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay, so we'll color code this one which is the first membrane spanning alpha helix in red, and that's going to be called the M1 membrane spanning alpha helix. Okay, then we'll color in the second membrane spanning alpha helix in orange. Okay, and that's going to be called the M2 membrane spanning alpha helix. So I might color code their names as well. So M2 is there in orange, M1 is here in red. Okay. We'll have M3, the third membrane spanning alpha helix, here in green. Okay, so that's M3. And then finally, we'll colour in the fourth membrane spanning alpha helix in blue here. Okay, so that is M4. Okay, right. Uh, so now what I want to do is I want to show you how you can put these subunits together to build one of these calcium release uh, activated calcium channels. Okay, so I'll start off with the tetramer. Okay, so this is what we thought crack channels were for an incredibly long time. Okay, so if you read papers from the early uh, 21st century, you will uh, see them talking about how crack is a tetramer. Okay, whereas if you read papers from 2013-2014, that sort of era, it's starting to emerge that it is in fact a hexama. Okay, but I'm going to start um, by showing you the tetramer because it still isn't decided basically. Some people still believe it's a tetramer, okay, some people now believe it's a hexama. So I'm going to show you both basically. Okay, right, so we'll start by the tetramer. So once again, here is the plasma membrane here. And now let's show our crack channel here. So here it is, like so. And it's going to be now made up of four of these Aura I1 proteins. Again, okay, each Aura I1 protein will make up a quarter of the channel. So let me now split it up into four quarters, like so. Okay, so this is one Aura I1 protein, this is another Aura I1 protein, this is a third, and this is a fourth. Okay, and let me now show you how uh, we believe the membrane spanning alpha helices are arranged uh, in this uh, tetramer. Okay, so what is known is that the M1 alpha helix is the one that um, faces into the pore. Okay, so in each one of these Aura I1 one subunits, you'll have the M1 alpha helix right in the center making up the pore. It's the one that lines the pore. Okay, and that's important, okay, because the M1 alpha helix has a really important uh, glutamate residue within it, okay, which is an acidic residue and ends up negatively charged. So let me just discuss this in a bit more detail. So basically, the M1 alpha helix here, it's the one which lines the pore. So if you're a calcium arm moving through this pore, you will be brushing up against the M1 helices uh, of all of the Aura I1 subunits, basically. Okay, now, each one of these M1 alpha helices has a glutamate residue within it, and together they're going to form a ring of glutamate residues at some point along this pore. Okay, now, let me just show you the structure of a glutamate residue, and then you'll understand why this is significant and why I'm even bringing this up. Okay, so I'm going to show you the structure of a glutamate residue. So I'll start by showing you the core amino acid structure then. So here is the amino group, as though it's bound to the carboxylic acid group of the amino acid prior to it. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. Here's the carboxylic acid group, as though it's bound to the amino group of the amino acid after it. 
Okay, and the R group of glutamate then consists of two methylene groups. So there's the two methylene groups. Okay, and then you have a carboxylic acid group here. Okay, now, under physiological conditions, under physiological pH, the carboxylic acid group of glutamate residues here does not usually have its proton attached onto it. Okay, the proton has usually dissociated away at normal physiological pH. Okay, uh, that means that the glutamate residue is therefore going to be left with an oxygen atom with a negative charge, basically. Okay, so most of the glutamate residues will not have their proton attached onto there. Instead, they'll have a negative charge. So this means now that these M2 alpha helices here are going to form a ring of negative charge in this pore. Now, why is that significant? Well, this channel is supposed to be selective for calcium ions. Calcium ions are a positively charged ion. Okay, they're going to like going through a channel that has a ring of negative charge around it. So that's one of the things that helps to select for positively charged ions, such as calcium ions, uh, within this crack channel pool. Okay, right. Uh, so that's the M1 alpha helix then that is uh, lining the pore. And I'm sorry, did I say M2 helix? I'm scared that I have said the M2 helix because the M2 helix is the one that lines the pore of cis loop thick and gated ion channels. Uh, if I said M2 at any point lining the heat pore, uh, erase it. It's M1 that lines the pore. Okay, right. So M1 alpha helices line the pore of this uh, calcium release activated calcium channel. Okay, now let's put on uh, the remaining alpha helices then. Okay, so uh, next up let's put on M2 then. Okay, so M2 sits behind M1 in this sort of position here. So I'll put it on for each of these uh, aura I subunits here. So this is the M2 sitting behind M1, not lining the pore, unlike in the great family of cis and gated R channels, where M2 is the one that lines the pore. Okay, next up I'll put M3, so M3 also sits behind M1 and alongside M2 over here. Okay, so there's M3, and then finally M4 sits behind all of them, like so, so behind M2 and M3 there, so there in blue is M4. So that is the tetrameric arrangement then of Aura I1 subunits to make a crack channel. However, we're now moving over to the idea that instead it might actually be a hexamer. So let me now show you the hexameric arrangement. Okay, now it's pretty much the same except for the fact that you have uh, six of them rather than just four of them. Okay, so this time I'll just show the channel looking down from above because it's easier to draw if I just draw it looking down from above. So here is the top of the channel, here's the pore going down the middle. Okay, and now it's going to be made up of six subunits rather than just four. Okay, so here are the four, sorry, the six different Aura I1 subunits making up our crack channel hexamer. Okay, now once again, even if it is a hexamer, it's still the M1 alpha helix that lines the pore. So here are the six M1 subunits now making up that pore. Again, they'll all have this glutamate residue uh, at a certain position which will be facing into the pore. So you've now got a ring of six glutamate residues, a ring effectively of six negative charged residues, which is going to help uh, select for uh, positively charged ions such as calcium. Okay, then again the uh, M2 alpha helices will be behind the M1, like so. Okay, and then we'll have the uh, M3 alpha helices also sitting behind M1 and next to the M2s here, like so. And then behind the M2 and the M3 alpha helices, you'll then have the M4s in blue here sitting out even further. Okay, so that is what the arrangement will be if it is a, a hexameric structure, the crack channel. Okay, right, so as I say, this is still controversial. The movement is towards the hexamer, but it is still controversial and it might swing back towards uh, the tetramer. 
Okay, right. So that's the structure of these calcium release activated calcium channels, these crack channels. Uh, what we now want to talk about is how do you get them to open because they're not usually open. Usually the pore is closed. Okay, uh, it's not actually conductive. Okay, now the full gating mechanism of these things isn't yet understood, okay, but what we do understand is that to make them open, a certain protein which we're about to discuss, the STIM1 protein, interacts with these CC domains, triggers some sort of conformational change in the crack channel, uh, which then leads to the pore becoming conductive, okay, so somehow opening whatever gate it has, okay, so the first thing then to point out is that whether the crack channel is a tetramer or a hexamer, the aura I subunits of the crack channel all have the CC domains dangling down into the cytoplasm. So this is this aura I uh, one subunit uh, um, CC domain here. Here is this aura I one subunit uh, CC domain dangling down here, and the two behind that will also have CC domains dangling down. Okay, and if, of course, it's a hexamer, we'll have six of the things dangling down into the cytoplasm. And it's these CC domains, then, that uh, STIM1 is going to interact with. Okay, so let me now introduce this next really important uh, protein, then. Okay, so the next really important protein in this store-operated calcium entry pathway is a protein called STIM1. Okay? Now, STIM1 stands for Stromal Interaction Molecule 1. Okay, so the ST is for stromal, the I is for interaction, okay, and then the M is for molecule, okay, and then of course it's Stromal Interaction Molecule 1. So, STIM1, Stromal Interaction Molecule 1, is a protein which is present in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so let me just draw it in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. So now this line does represent the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Okay, and here this is going to be our STIM1 protein. Okay, now on the luminal side of the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, which is this side down here, the STIM1 protein has two important calcium binding sites here, okay, which are going to be structures known as EF hand calcium binding sites, which I'll discuss in more detail in just a moment. Okay, so let's colour the STIM1 protein then in, in blue here. So it's sitting within the ER membrane. This is representing the ER membrane. This is the luminal side here. This is the cytoplasmic side here. Okay, now I just want to add on one more really important domain of STIM1 here, which I'll colour in a separate colour. Okay, and this is the domain that is eventually going to interact with the CC domain of the crack channels to activate them. Okay, and for short, this domain is abbreviated to the CAD domain. Okay, and what this stands for is the crack activating domain. Okay, so calcium release activated calcium channel activating domain. Okay. So we'll denote that in green. And as I say, that's the portion that's going to interact with the CC domains of the Aura I1 subunits of the crack channel, basically, and lead to the crack channel opening. Okay, right. So firstly, let me just go back to these uh, calcium binding domains that are on the luminal side of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, because they are a special type of calcium binding domain known as an EF hand. And we are going to see a lot of proteins in this video which have these same sort of structures called EF hand domains, which are capable of binding to calcium. So I just want to explain to you what actually is an EF hand domain. Okay, right. So the first EF hand domain then was found in a protein called parvalbumin, which has the capacity to bind to calcium ions. Okay, and this domain was found to be one of the domains of parvalbumin which was capable of binding to calcium ions. Okay, so let me now show you the structure of an EF hand domain then. Uh, so basically, an EF hand domain has two alpha helices with a, a loop in between them, 
and this kind of a domain is more generally referred to as a helix turn helix motif. Okay, but EF hands are special helix turn helix motifs uh, which have uh, the capacity to bind calcium. And I'll explain exactly what it is that allows them to bind calcium in a moment. So basically, in these EF hand domains within proteins, what you have is two alpha helices. So here is this first alpha helix here. Okay, like so. Then you have a loop, which is this portion here. And then you'll have another alpha helix after the loop here. Okay, which will go off in a different direction. So to colour this in then, this is our first helix here. This is what this helix in the name helix turn helix refers to. So this helix in green, that's the first helix. Okay, then we have this turn in between the two helices. So that's the turn here. Okay, and then we have another helix uh, here in this helix turn helix motif. Okay, so all EF hand domains have the same basic helix turn helix structure. They have two alpha helices separated by this turn in between them. Okay, now in parvalbumin, uh, the two alpha helices that were involved in this initial EF hand domain were called alpha helix number, or rather letter E, and alpha helix F. So specifically in this protein, parvalbumin, when we first found an example of an EF hand domain, uh, it had these two alpha helices which had already been named E and F, basically. So that's where the EF comes from. The reason it's called a hand domain is because it's thought to look like uh, the um, ring finger here with the thumb. Oh, sorry, not the ring finger, the index finger here with the thumb, so it's supposed to look like that. So that's why uh, it's called uh, the EF hands domain, basically. Okay, so so far we haven't seen anything that makes these helix turn helixes special. Well, the special thing is that they are capable of binding calcium. Okay, so an EF hand domain then is one of these helix turn helixes which is capable of binding calcium. Now, where can they bind calcium? Well, they can bind calcium basically in this loop here. A calcium ion can bind in there. Now, how can they bind calcium ions? Well, it's because in this loop region here, in this turn region of EF hand domains, but not in more general helix turn helix domains, uh, you are going to have lots of glutamate and aspartate residues. Okay, now we have seen the structure of a glutamate residue. The structure of an aspartate residue is very similar to the structure of a glutamate residue. Okay, aspartate, if you like, is the baby version of glutamate. Okay, so if I just go back up to my picture of glutamate up here, I'll show you how to modify it to turn it into aspartate. So to turn this glutamate into an aspartate, all you need to do is scrap that two there. Okay, take away the two just have one methylene uh, group there, okay, and then the carboxylic acid group, and you've now got aspartate. So it's just a shorter version of glutamate, basically. Okay, but the key thing about these two residues, glutamate and aspartate, what they both share is that at physiological pH, their carboxylic acid group will donate its proton away into free solution, and they'll end up with a negative charge on that oxygen atom there. Okay, so the key thing to understand here is if we have lots of glutamate and aspartate residues in this turn, we're going to end up with a lot of negative charge in this turn, which of course is going to be good if we want to bind a calcium ion here, which has a double positive charge. Okay, so that's what the turn has that is special in an EF hand domain that allows it to coordinate calcium. Okay, so to summarise then, an EF hand domain is one of these domains that is analogous to the domain that we originally found in parvalbumin, where we had these two alpha helices arranged in a helix turn helix uh, fashion. Okay, and these two alpha helices were called E and F. They looked like a hand, okay, so they were called the EF hand domain, okay, and they are capable of binding calcium within the turn region. 
Okay. okay. Later on, it was then found that loads of other proteins have similar calcium binding domains where you have helix turn helices um, with uh, the turn having the special property that has lots of glutamate and aspartate residues within it so that then a calcium arm can coordinate there. So I want to stress that not all helix turn helix motifs that you find in many different proteins are REF hands. Okay. Not all of them will have the uh, high level of glutamate and aspartate residues in the turn that is needed to actually bind the calcium arm. Okay, so we are going to see lots of proteins with EF hand domains in, and for short, they can be abbreviated down to EFH, like so. Okay, so STIM1 then has two EF hand domains, one here and one here. Okay, so two of these turns where calcium can bind, basically. Okay, so normally then, when calcium level is at the normal level within the endoplasmic reticulum, okay, so calcium level is normal, calcium normal within the endoplasmic reticulum, you have calcium bound to these EF hand domains. Okay, so you'll have two calcium ions bound, one here and one here. Okay, and I'll colour those calciums in an orange here. Okay, right. And when the STIM1 protein has two calcium ions bound to its EF hand domains, like that so, it does nothing, okay? It doesn't do anything, okay? So it's happily floating around in the ER membrane and not activating crack channels, okay? However, what now happens is when calcium goes down below the normal level in the endoplasmic reticulum lumen, of course, what's going to now happen is the EF hand domains will lose their calcium, Okay, so we're going to lose the calcium bound to the EF hand mains. Okay, what that is now going to mean is that those EF hand mains are going to be empty, and that triggers a big change in the activity of STIM1. What starts to happen is STIM1 proteins start to aggregate together. So let me draw this here. Okay, so you're going to start getting these aggregates of STIM1 proteins. So these are loads of STIM1 proteins that have all lost their calcium ions and which are now all aggregating together. So here are their uh, crack activating domains up in green here. Okay, and here are uh, the rest of the STIM1 proteins shown here in blue. And they have lost the calcium ions from their EF hand domains. Okay, so now what's happening is aggregation of STIM1 proteins. Okay, and these STIM1 aggregates localize themselves in ways that are still not well understood. They localize themselves in the portions of the ER membrane which are close to the plasma membrane and which can contact crack channels. So remember we talked about these junctions between the ER membrane and the plasma membrane. Basically these STIM1 aggregates are going to go into uh, these portions of the ER membrane which are close to the plasma membrane. Okay, so they're going to localize where they can actually uh, gain access to crack channels basically and have some effect on the crack channels. Okay, so they relocate basically to these special portions of the plasma membrane and now what's going to happen is these crack activating domains here are going to interact with the CC domains of the uh, crack channels Okay, so am I going to be able to draw this on this picture? No, I'm going to have to uh, now draw a separate little picture. So here we're going to have our STIM1 aggregate here. Here are the crack activating domains here. Okay, and the rest of the STIM1 protein here. And once again, I'll just color these in. So blue is denoting the rest of the STIM1 protein. Okay, and then we'll have in green here the crack activating domains. Okay, and now what's going to happen is these are going to be interacting with the crack channels here. So here is our crack channel via interacting with the uh, CC domains that are dangling down from the crack channel. Okay, and I'll just show two of those, but of course, uh, in reality, each crack channel would either have four or six, depending on whether the reality is that it's a tetramer or hexamer. Okay, right, and this somehow leads to these crack channels now opening. Okay, so they will now open, conduct calcium into the cytoplasm, and this calcium then will be pumped into the endoplasmic reticulum by our old friend, the circa pump here. 
Okay, right, and that is the pathway of store-operated calcium entry. Of course, when calcium gets back up to the normal level, calcium will start to bind to the EF hand domains of the STIM1 proteins again. The aggregate will break up, okay, and it will no longer be activating the crack channels. The crack channels will close, and therefore you'll have an end to this store-operated calcium entry pathway. Now, there is a lot of interest at the moment, a lot of research going into the fact that actually in this store-operated calcium entry pathway, you generate a calcium signal in the middle of it, basically. Okay, so when you're trying to refill the endoplasmic reticulum, the calcium first has to come into the cytoplasm. Therefore, calcium is going to go up in the cytoplasm be above 100 nanomolar, that's the whole idea, okay, so that you can then bring the calcium more easily from the cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. Okay, so store-operated calcium entry generates calcium signals in the cytoplasm, okay, and those calcium signals can activate effectors of calcium signaling. Okay, and there is a lot of interest at the moment as to how store-operated calcium entry signals can cause very different effects to other calcium signals that can be generated in other ways. Okay, and the reason is that these store-operated calcium entry signals, they'll be occurring in these little portions of cytoplasm at these junctions between the plasma membrane and the ER. Okay, potentially in very different places to where other calcium signals would occur. Maybe, for instance, you might have a voltage-gated calcium channel over here, which can let calcium in and generate a calcium signal over there, and that can activate certain effectors. But of course, the store-operated calcium entry signal will be in a very different portion of the cytoplasm, basically, and it might be able to activate very different effectors to a signal over here, simply because there are different effectors over here. This is the concept of the being micro-domains, basically. Calcium signaling micro-domains, okay? So the idea is that calcium signals in different micro-domains of the cell are going to activate different effectors, simply because in different micro-domains you have different effectors for the calcium. So the idea is that the store-operated calcium entry micro-domains have certain effectors which the calcium that comes into the cytoplasm in store-operated calcium entry can activate, and that those effectors might be very different from the effectors that can be activated by different calcium signals. Okay, so there is a lot of interest into this, and it's still an area where we're not fully sure of what the full physiological significance of it is yet, but it is an exciting area that is receiving a lot of attention. Okay, right, so that concludes our discussion of store-operated calcium entry. In the next video, we'll turn our attention onto the IP3 receptors and their signaling pathways.